Hello, Peoria Heights. We're back with a, another very special and I must say unprecedented edition of Tower Talk, which for the very first time has taken its show on the road, uh, actually outside the village of Peoria Heights itself. We are so happy to be today at the Peoria Riverfront Museum in downtown Peoria. Uh, specifically, we're in the new folk art gallery here, um, and we're even more pleased, if that is possible, to have as our guest the inestimable John Morris, CEO and president of this fine institution. Welcome, John. Glad to have you. Thank you, Mike Bailey. It's a pleasure. So John has some news for Peoria Heights today, but first we want to talk about the museum in the year 2020, uh, which has been pretty mean to many of us, really. So but let's, let's get started. John, tell us about this place, which builds itself as, I quote, the only multidisciplinary museum of its kind in the nation. So um, tell us a little bit about this place and why you think Central, Central Illinois should be spending as much time as humanly possible here when they, when they get the chance to do so again. Well, just like Peoria Heights itself, which is unique in the nation. It has Grandview Drive, it has the best little shopping and restaurants, has beautiful homes, it's got a variety of a diversity of residential life, and for a town of 6,000 or so, it's one of the most incredible little uh, villages in, in the whole country. We're gonna hire John as ambassador. Well, right. I, you know, <laughs> I, I'm part, of, part of the museum's role is history, and I can yeah. tell you, it's really yeah. special. And, and it's not just sort of the the jurisdiction, the political jurisdiction of the Heights that makes it special because there's all kind of drama and stories behind that form mm -hmm. and so forth. But I remember as a child, uh, the, the, the fire hydrants were all painted uh, like little animals and things. Yes. I think it was a, uh, one of Bill Rutherford's uh, many uh, brainstorms, but uh, from the tower, only one of its kind and mm -hmm. so forth. So uh, it's, it's an honor to sit down with Peoria Heights today because the Peoria Riverfront Museum much like the Heights is unique mm -hmm. among all the towns and villages of the country, mm -hmm. uh, Peoria Riverfront Museum is much like that. It comes out of the same kind of genetic code, mm -hmm. I think, here in Central Illinois. We didn't have a fine art museum over here, a history center over here, a science and technology center over here, a planetarium on another mm -hmm. part of the town. We combine these into one multidisciplinary art, science, history, and achievement museum. Mm -hmm. It all started with the Lakeview Museum of Arts and Sciences in the mid-1960s, uh, but eight years ago, in 2012, October, when the doors opened on the Peoria Riverfront Museum, a privately funded operation living in a county-owned mm -hmm. building, we did something nobody had ever done, mm -hmm. and that is create a museum of all of these things, art, science, history, achievement, a planetarium, and the only giant screen theater at a museum in the state of Illinois, mm -hmm. and right. including what I call upstate Illinois. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So you and I have known each other for a long time, but not everyone is familiar uh, with your background. So why don't you talk a little bit about how long you've been in charge here and what you, what you did prior to, uh, to this, uh, to prepare yourself to leave this place and what interested you in this job? Well, thank you. I'm a proud native son of Peoria, born in 1968, right here in Peoria, Richwoods High School graduate, and, and uh, have lived most of my life in Peoria, with the exception of six years in undergraduate graduate school at the George Washington mm -hmm. University of Washington, D.C., where I really first became exposed to museums. Mm -hmm. The Smithsonian, the National Gallery of Art, then what was called the Corcoran, the Phillips, the, all these great institutions, and surrounded by history and monuments. And as a Peoria guy uh, living in uh, Washington, D.C. and studying there, I fell in love with the power of museums to use objects to tell stories. Mm -hmm. Stories inspire us. Mm -hmm. History, particularly, is not about the past. It uses the past to inform the present and inspire the future. And, so uh, my career began right out of graduate school back here in Peoria mm -hmm. at the old Lake Museum of Arts and Sciences in really? 1992 to 1997. Yeah. I was the head of uh, fundraising development oh, okay. office and uh, then from there I went wow, and, full circle. Uh, 10 years yeah. with the PBS member station yeah. or WTVP to help convert to digital and then 10 years at Eureka College, all of it in working with the most generous people of our community, the philanthropic community and mm -hmm. I came full circle in some ways. I, I always have loved and 
been passionate about the museum world. I started my career out of grad school in the museum world, but I am uh, one way, shape, or form, and for whatever reason, the first local director that our museum, Lake Museum, or the Peoria Riverfront Museum has had. Right. And I think that the board here, our board chairman, Steve Jackson, uh, now and our 21-member board who serves uh, generously giving and voluntarily uh, helping lead this institution. I think that they asked me to serve here because I have a heart for this community in general. And if I may say, an excellent choice. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I lead a, a super talented team. Every member of this team is just brilliant, our curatorial team, our educators. Um, and most importantly, I, I serve and we serve together just the most incredible part of this incredible country. Right. Central Illinois is so rich in so many stories that have yet to be told mm -hmm. or un uncovered. So the museum does that uh, every day, either virtually, right now virtually, because we've been closed. Uh, uh, this is our second time for the closure uh, mm -hmm. during this pandemic, but we do it virtually all the time, uh, video and digital, mm -hmm. things like this. But we also, uh, we also have a phenomenal array of exhibitions and sure. changing gallery space, films, planetarium shows. So I'm happy to be here. So that's a good segue to our next question because it's probably fair to say that none of us could have predicted 2020 uh, and very little of what we did before really equipped us for the challenge that were to come. Uh, if you're looking from early March forward. Uh, so, what were you thinking when the governor closed this place, like so many other businesses, in, uh, last spring, mid-March? Well, let me answer this question yeah. in a totally, uh, maybe unexpected way. I'm going to give you a few of the positives. Yeah. Although this is a global pandemic resulting in, uh, in death, and destruction to the economy, and other things. Yeah. Let me give you some positives that it did for us. We had already launched something called the Digital Initiative. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to engage our stakeholders, our students, our families, uh, those enthusiastic uh, about museum content on a daily basis in ways that meet both their interests and their needs. Mm -hmm. Those are different sometimes. So we had already started some uh, YouTube programming, some live streaming. Mm -hmm. uh, our Facebook page had grown to 18,000 followers, uh, one of the largest of the nonprofits in the whole area. Mm -hmm. uh, but what COVID shutdown did for us was uh, we had our toes in the water of, of digital communication. It just pushed us all in. Sure. We had a meeting the very next day after closure of this mm -hmm. museum. We went around the room, we came up with at least 12 ideas, all of which were implemented for new programs. Right. We started a program called Objectively Speaking, in which our curators went back in the vaults or in the galleries and talked about the story behind of a sculpture or a fossil, minerals, or objectively speaking. Ob objectively <laughs> speaking. Uh, we had a viewing room, live streaming programs where right. we actually addressed great works of art in other collections from yeah. the Frick Museum in New York and other places. So, uh, you know, that's one positive is that it's accelerated our digital initiative. Mm -hmm. And I would have to say we're, we're one of the most active for a small staff, yeah. 28 full time people. We're one of the most active museums on, on the digital front uh, of any. The other thing it did is it forced us to really look at our student programs differently. We had launched in my first year on the job, three and a half years ago, something called the Every Student Initiative, mm -hmm. in which for Peoria and now East Peoria schools, and we're hoping to add, add, the, heights, to add the heights and add other school districts in the area, but for those public school districts, uh, we had uh, field trips curriculum related field trips for every K through eighth grade student paid for by generous donors. Mm -hmm. um, what this did, the COVID shutdown is canceled those field trips, but we have now been able to offer free passes for students to bring their entire families for free. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also gone virtual on, on our every student initiative curriculum based learning, have virtual tours and so forth. So there, there have been some positive uh, uh, responses. What else do you do? Well, that's right. That's right. What else you put one foot in front of the other, right? You keep moving forward. So um, so overall, what has been the impact on the museum, though, of having that much time off? I know you reopened on July yeah. 1st for a time, but uh, I guess I, my question is how, how you've made a go of it without people walking through the turnstiles. You know, it, it's, it's incredible because we were closed for three and a half months, mm -hmm. uh, and yet we ended our fiscal year, the second strongest fiscal year of our eight-year really? eight history. It's well, then how, did, how, how did you manage that? There's one answer. <laughs> 
on philanthropy. Okay. The donor base in our community, since I've been here, we've grown from 99 folks that give us $1,000 a year or greater. We call them the Visionary yeah. Society to 326. Wow. And of those... You've been working the phones. Well, I've been working <laughs> the phones. I, I, you know, I, don't, I, I don't go to lunch with anybody. Yeah. They don't say, if you have the ability to do it, can you give a thousand or fifteen hundred or twenty five hundred? No, not everybody can do that. Yeah. You're a young family, no, you don't have disposable yeah. income. Maybe you can. Maybe you can become a family member for one hundred ten bucks. Yeah. You do that. We have forty three hundred people yeah. who are who are family members or individual members. But the big donors, some at fifty thousand, thirty thousand, twenty five thousand. We've got uh, fifty donors now. Give ten thousand or more wow. per year. That's great. So that's the way the museum is able to do virtual programming, able to do collections and exhibitions able to redo galleries like this. And uh, and we've also been very controlled in our expenses. Mm -hmm. We've reduced our marketing expenses down to virtually nothing. When you're closed, you don't yeah. need to market yeah. folks to come in. And we've been very, very careful, but we've held on to every single full-time staff member. Well, I was going to ask my next question, so you did. Yeah. You, no you, st you no staff reduction. Go. That's great. Uh, staff here has taken a hit. We've taken two sure. weeks of furlough, starting with me and everybody yeah. unpaid, unpaid uh, furlough for two weeks, one, yeah. one week now and one week in the next, in the next six month period. Uh, and that saved us some money, but we're a $5 million annual operating budget. Mm -hmm. um, that is inclusive of the value of the building, which the county owns. Sure. But every dime of this place from an operational standpoint comes from private contributions or earned revenue at the game. So. so when you reopen on July 1st, how did that go? What, so what July, yeah, July and September, 5% attendance year over year. Oh. Not not fifty percent, five percent. Right. One one twentieth the number right. of people coming in. One, we weren't spending a lot of marketing to let people know we were reopened. Yeah. Our members were coming disproportionately high. But then by September we we're up to twenty five percent. October we're closing in on fifty percent mm -hmm. of last year's attendance number. So we're really growing with the guitar exhibition. Sure. But as the COVID numbers started going up you could see immediate yeah, decline right. in attendance, and then the governor shut down all museums in the state of Illinois, and we adhere to our the standards of the state of Illinois. We have masks required in the yeah. museum. We have hand sanitizers just in every single corner of the museum. Right. Uh, social distancing required. We're very careful, but we, like I said earlier, we have to control the controllables. There are a number of things we can't control, but what we can control is our our level of gratitude for our donors because without sure. them we would not well, we wouldn't be sustaining well speaking of masks i do have to ask you about uh about who masked the uh, uh god bless america yeah. sculpture uh, out the uh the, the uh, giant american gothic, the american inspired, gothic inspired yeah, Stuart Johnson, so that's right 26 foot so tall. is that so prankster did you are you responsible well to that? you know mike uh, a lot of people said john <laughs> great job putting that giant mask on i did not do it we don't know did it. We have yeah. security cameras everywhere, but when the museum was built, that particular pad, it's a little blind spot. So we actually went back out of curiosity to see who put a ladder so you up. you literally have no idea. We no idea. You're not even wink wink in there. No wink wink. I still don't know, <laughs> but I will tell you this. Because you have that? It's a tall. I the mask, know, 26. 26. 26 yeah. uh, the mask is about, you know, yeah. four feet across, and they used uh, electrical wiring, okay. actually, as the as the hook. Yeah. And it just fit perfectly on there. And uh, the, the farmer, the yeah. male figure, yes. had ears, so they could hook it on. The female figure did not, yeah. and I think it, it and so uh, she didn't get a mask. Uh, and I, I got a lot of hits on that. People said, why didn't you mask the one? Well, we didn't. We made the decision to leave the mask up. Uh, but then Seward Johnson's foundation relocated the, the sculpture yeah. according to our plan yeah, contract. Okay. So yeah. we're very pleased recently we facilitated the return of the first Seward Johnson sculpture, mm -hmm. return visit, the Lincoln and the Common Man, yeah. uh, has just landed in Washington, Illinois. Yeah, that's we're right. happy to facilitate that, that's right. that return of return. I was going to bring it up because I know you had a very direct hand in making that happen. So. Uh, so what are we going to get in the Heights now? What, we, we, have go, we have to go through the collection and see what you got that we can borrow. Well, you know, <laughs> the thing I want to get in the Heights more than anything is I want to get a relationship going with the families and the residents of the Heights, even more so than we have now. We've got hundreds of members yeah. that are uh, connected to the Heights, but we, we really need to set up a school relationship like we have with Peoria and East Peoria schools. Yeah. So we'll work on that. We'll yeah. work on that. But we, we are bringing some of the most incredible exhibitions that we've ever been able to bring. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, this spring, we, Ken Burns, the mm -hmm. documentary filmmaker, 
Civil War, so, uh, jazz, baseball, baseball yeah. national parks. It's great. Ken Burns happens to be the mo one of the most important quilt collectors in the United States. <laughs> yeah. Private collection of quilts. He's never done a documentary yeah. on quilts, but yeah. uh, we are one of three museums in the country to show his oh, private cool. quilt collection. So I'm pleased about that. We're working with the Chicago History Museum to bring one of the most important railroad railroaders photography exhibitions mm -hmm. ever. Um, that uh, that Chicago History Museum organized about five years ago. Bon French, mm -hmm. who's a native Peorian, lives in Chicago, former chairman of the board of mm -hmm. Chicago History Museum, is helping to facilitate that, and um, it's really going to be very special. And then this summer, we bring the biggest exhibition in the history of Peoria, the T-Rex, the ultimate predator. Right. What's special about T-Rex, the ultimate predator, is it comes from one of the greatest largest museums in the country, the American Museum of Natural History in New York City mm -hmm. on Central Park, the Night at the Museum Museum. Oh, okay, sure. Okay, yeah. so they are the discoverers of the T-Rex. They're the ones who initially, their scientists initially found the T-Rex uh, in, uh, in North America. Uh, and uh, to celebrate their 150th or sesquicentennial anniversary this past year, they did the biggest T-Rex exhibition that's ever been done. Mm -hmm. With all the latest theories, with gra interactives, robotics, I mean, it's incredible. Cool. So I went out and met with the president of the American Museum of Natural History. Mm -hmm. um, and sure enough, Peoria will be the first museum on an international tour that will go for 10 years right. of the T-Rex exhibition this yeah. summer, 2021. Yeah. So uh, we're excited to be leading the way in that regards the first time an international major exhibition mm -hmm. has debuted in PR. Well, let's talk about that because you talked about, you know, uh, how critical it is for you to build relationships, right? And so you make that call. And I imagine, you know, I mean, it's a guy from Peoria, sort of, and you didn't Is that a real place, Peoria? Yeah, Peoria, that's right. I no, think, it's kind of the, the, the... But you're making those phone calls, and you have a relationship with the Whitney, correct? The Whitney Museum yeah, in New York the, as well. The that's Waltons, right. as in those Waltons, the... Benville, the Arkansas, Walmart, the Walmart yeah, Fortune, uh, yeah. Alice Walton uh, yeah. is uh, involved with our museum now as well. So it is all about relationships, yeah. and we've been building some very strategically important relationships. And how do you see that being a benefit to the people of Central Illinois yeah. as we move forward? Well, the, this the, is all going to be over. Yeah, the time. first big way that Alice Walton's involvement through her Art Bridges Foundation that she founded, mm -hmm. she's the wealthiest woman in the United mm -hmm. States, so uh, estimated net worth Billions. 53 yeah. billion dollars so she's writing checks to the Peoria Roof Fund Museum through her foundation wow. so this is importing philanthropy yeah you know if, if we were creating a new business here that sold widgets and the widgets were being sold all over uh, you know the country or the world uh, such as Caterpillar selling its products all over the world the, that money comes back in our economy same thing is beginning to happen with our Center for American decoys the mm -hmm. amount of money that is coming in here to help us tell the story of one of the very few indigenous American art forms, folk art, carved mm -hmm. uh, decoys. And we had the greatest of all the decoys up and down the Illinois mm -hmm. River Valley. So Alice Walton, interested in American art, right. contemporary art, uh, uh, photography, painting, sculpture, any, any kind of American art. And so uh, we're working with her right now to bring in three uh, enormously uh, important uh, works by African-American artists. Including Mark Bradford of Los Angeles, and um, and so uh, you know Carrie James Marshall preparatory drawings for Carrie James Marshall painting called Our Town, which Mrs. Walton owned. So I don't want to get into all the, all the nitty gritty details, but suffice it to say, the team I have here are very talented. Mm -hmm. The curators, Bill Conger, our chief curator, and, and his team, Zach Zetterberg, the mm -hmm. Center for American Decoys, and Lonnie Fittis. Uh, history, Renee Kerrigan at Science the Planetarium, and, and just the whole across the board, they are constantly working to give us relationships that we would never otherwise have right. in Central Illinois. Recruiting philanthropy, recruiting the best art and science, and the, the best entertainment possible. And uh, one other way we're doing this is we have just hired one of the leading authors and scholars on classic Hollywood. Oh, really? A man named Mark Elliott, mm -hmm. E-L-I-O-T. Mm -hmm. Mark lives in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. He's a longtime friend of mine, but has written 25 best-selling books, mm -hmm. uh, uh, biographies mm -hmm. on, on great, uh, mostly Hollywood figures. Mark is going to be our resident curator here, and from Manhattan right now, he's curating what will become a weekly classic 
Hollywood okay. um, film series, starting with The Bridge on the River Kwai, yeah. Yeah. on the waterfront. He'll do some foreign films, some classic American films, and we're, he's going to bring a level of film experience on the only giant screen theater yeah. at a museum in the whole state of Illinois, 70 foot wide yeah. giant screen theater. So that's another way that we're bringing some talent in that, you know, we don't have best-selling yeah. authors on classic Hollywood figures anywhere right. in Central Illinois. And at Mark Elliott's level, there are very few in the whole country. Well, you certainly did not sit still here during this downtime. I mean, uh, and you can, you can see around. We've done this beautiful gallery, folk gallery. gallery. You've got um, great plans for the, 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 old, the IHSA uh, exhibit. You're gonna be, there's going to be a facelift there. So talk about some of the things so you've the already next, done and then you have envisioned. Yeah, the next big thing, I think people will be surprised uh, when they come into this museum with the changes that have taken place. The next big thing is in the Katie and Jim Owens Gallery. We're sitting now in the Folk area, the Decoys area. This is the Doug and Diane Oberhelman Gallery. Mm -hmm. Katie and Jim Owens Gallery, named for another yeah, former chairman of Caterpillar, yeah. has been the history section of our museum with those old building facades and so forth. We're in, a, in the process of keeping it history, but a major conversion with a beautiful blue paint mm -hmm. that will feature in the centerpiece uh, at the back of this gallery, but at the center focal point of the gallery, Preston Jackson, the most famous yeah. artist of our community, uh, has been making a work of art for more than 25 years. Mm -hmm. It's entitled Bronzeville to Harlem. Yes. We've added the title An American Story. Mm -hmm. So Bronzeville to Harlem, An American Story is 100 years ago the Great Migration in the United States took place where black Americans began to move north, escaping the Jim Crow South in search of opportunity. Mm -hmm. And they began settling in places like Peoria. Mm -hmm. Chicago, Bronzeville section of Chicago became one of the hot spots for black American life. Business creation, the first black millionaires, establishment, poets, churches, uh, uh, the life, the livelihood, and Harlem in New York City became the most famous of those locales of the Great Migration. This piece has more than 100 bronze figures, about mm -hmm. six, eight inches yeah. tall, painted bronze, solid bronze. Yeah. And they're all based on real figures yeah. with their own stories of American opportunity. Yeah. And I think it's gonna be one of the most uplifting people, uh, up, uplifting pieces of art in our entire region. And there is nothing like it in the whole uh, world. I mean, there's nobody who's ever done, and he has buildings and uh, I'll, I'll get you some pictures of yeah. it. It's incredible. Right. Well, you've done a really fantastic job of really adding to your art collection here. I know uh, you mentioned Preston. I know Lonnie Stewart's got the Stein in front Lonnie of Lonnie Stewart's and, incredible. Yeah. He's a great, generous supporter, yeah. visionary society member here, but yeah. also one of the most preeminent artists of our region yeah. and one of the most preeminent personalities. Right, Lonnie's right. a dear friend of mine at right. this museum, and he made this enormous nine foot tall bronze stein yeah. to commemorate our relationship with our sister city yeah. Friedrichshof in Germany yeah. one of our sister cities yeah. and it sits in front of the museum right now and, and every day I look out there even since we've been closed and I see people stopping walking around and taking pictures of it. Lonnie's doing a big piece for Peoria Heights he's uh, Teddy Roosevelt. What a wonderful addition that will be yeah. Lonnie Stewart's piece. And it's enormous I mean it's it, it will be un, unforgettable. Yeah. And, and TR's visit to yeah. uh, Peoria yeah. and his reflection of the world's most beautiful drive on yeah. Grandview Drive, uh, it's really, it's an important part of history that until that sculpture, I'm not sure there's been kind of a punctuation. Yeah. And that, that's going to punctuate it. Uh, Lonnie, cool. Lonnie's a, such a talent. So you recently had Peoria Heights officials here. I know the mayor was here uh, recently. And so what did you talk about? I know you got something coming up for... Last for year we did a Peoria Heights Day, a right. free day at the museum, and we're, we're, we're going to do another one. Yeah. Uh, we, the date will be set soon, but uh, we can't it's do it now. We're right? closed, yeah, but as soon as the coast yeah. is clear, yeah. we're going to do free admission for every, all Peoria Heights uh, residents. Uh, yeah. and. And we want to really build that relationship with the schools and the residents of Peoria Heights. Uh, we, we feel like there's a kinship with Peoria Heights. And, and, uh, in fact, we see John quite a bit in Peoria Heights. Um, he, uh, I run across you all the time at the Betty Jane Brimmer Center for the Performing Arts, for example. Yes. Um, Kim Blickenstaff's a fun guy to be around. And Kim Blickenstaff yeah. is amazing. And as, as we have discussed, Mike, uh, mm -hmm. his interest in Peoria Heights is really, uh, to his credit, mm -hmm because he's found the jewel, but it's also to the Heights credit, because Kim Blickenstaff doesn't invest lightly. Right. I mean, he knows that the, that the makings of 
greatness and, and the continued uh, makings of greatness are found in, in the village of Peoria Heights. And I, I, I think it's good for everybody in the whole region, the city of Peoria at large and other communities to see the way that Heights, Mayor Phelan is doing a phenomenal job in my opinion. Uh, um, you've got great uh, village board members, uh, Beth Kazam, Elizabeth Kazam is a long time involved with this museum and other places in the community. And there are many others in the Heights, but Mike Phelan is, um, he is a, he's quite a force of, of nature. I know they're all eager to collaborate with this museum and find ways that we can do things together, you know. And, and it kind of brings me to my next question and my final question, because we want to wrap things up. So, but I, I wonder if you could tell us how you view the mission of this place, um, its role in the community, what it is and what it can become. Inspiration, mm -hmm. period. Mm -hmm. A community that seeks to inspire each other and be inspired by each other is a community that's going to grow in its economy, it's going to be more civically engaged and active, it's going to be more thoughtful in the way it raises its families and children, it's going to attract businesses, it will be confident. The community that knows itself has to have some authentic reason to know itself. 18,000 years ago, when the moraine broke on that glacial lake that mm -hmm. was in northern Illinois, and a massive wall of water rushed through and formed the Illinois River Valley in an instant, in a, an event that geologists call the Kankakee Torrent. Mm -hmm. And the Native Americans have been here for three times longer than the pyramids of Egypt. And the French settled here first, first in the entire, really in the entire Midwest, mm -hmm. The French settlers first came in 1680 and then later came back in 1691. And since 1691 on, there have been permanent settlements of European immigrants and others, both within the country and from without the country, seeking opportunity. Peoria is so rich in our history and we need to know it. Yeah. We need to be proud of it. And Peoria Heights, just the village of Peoria Heights, that's 6,000 people has a story so big it out, it's outsides, it out, outpaces uh, most of any other community. So anyway, I'm, I'm proud to be from this region. I hope that other people are, and this museum seeks to build confidence, spark learning, and unleash the full talent and genius of every individual. You have to know where you've been and know where you're going. So that wraps up another Tower Talk today. Um, thank you to John Morris, CEO of Peoria Riverfront Museum, for being such a gracious host today, as he always is. And most of all, uh, let us say that this museum may showcase history and sciences and the arts and achievement, um, but it is a place that is very, very much alive, uh, and it belongs to all of us in Central Illinois, and we, mean, we need to make much greater use of it. Um, and so I encourage the good people of Peoria Heights uh, when we have Peoria Heights Day, but on any other day, please stop by for a visit. Uh, you'll be very happy you did. Um, stay tuned for more information about that. Uh, and in the meantime, happy holidays, everybody, and until next time, thank you.